So this morning, it's great to, to be with you guys and to, to share a moment like that. I think to, to see lives changed is what the church is meant to see. It's meant to see people being impacted, people being ignited, people being set free, people changing mindsets and really claiming what God has for them. Um, so if, if you're joining us on, on, online this morning, welcome to you. And if you prayed that prayer, um, I pray that it changes you, it ignites something in you um, and moves you forward. And if you're on that Zoom group, I know Brett will pray for you just now um, as we get going. It's so awesome. I, I was reflecting this, this week on um, COVID and kind of it's a bit hard not to, but it's reflecting on COVID and thinking through how the church has been shaped and molded and how it's been changed by, by, by what we're going through as a pandemic. Um, and it's, it's hard to find positives. But one incredible positive is that people have turned to me and, uh, and those that have said to me in the past, look, I'm never, ever going to go online. It just, it's never going to happen. I'm either too old or it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like church. And suddenly people have had to go online. Uh, we've all had to be in that space where we've had to go online. And um, it has changed the way we see church. So when we're looking at cameras this morning and we're looking at you, we're looking at people all around the world, basically. Um, so it's, it's incredible to see the impact of the church, whether it be uh, Hope Ridge or other churches in the world, um, because the gospel is being spread in a whole new, new medium and people's lives are being changed. So I pray that your lives are changed this morning online. We hit week three today of our Faith Actually series as the lean and I work through the, the book of Acts with you. Taking pieces of the book of Acts over the six-week period and expanding upon it. If you missed the last two weeks for some reason and you missed church, there's no judgment here, but there is an opportunity for you to catch up. Um, you can go onto the YouTube channel and you can go and see those sermons uh, live and uh, you can get that material as well. Like I said, through uh, Linktree, you can get the home group material and really follow. The home group material really takes you deeper into what we're doing. So this morning, we've, we've progressed to chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Acts as we take snapshots of people's transformation through the power of the gospel with them and how faith actually needs to transform us. And I pray for those three ladies this morning that the gospel and the, the scriptures and the Holy, through the power of the Holy Spirit has transformed the way you think, transformed you. And if we look back at the word transformation or transform, what is it that pops into your mind? Is it something that changes, adapts, shifts, evolves, maybe a power utility of ESCOM that keeps blowing up, a transformer. Come on, that was funny. Maybe it's this guy, a transformer. What is it that pops into your mind? Is it the Marvel comics for the youngsters here with us today? The older folk are like, what is that? It's called a transformer. Go watch the movie. However you see it, one thing is certain, that if we are to impact the world for Christ, we have to surrender the, to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it any other way. These characters in Acts 8 and 9 are the prime examples of changing the world through transforming the heart and the mind with God's word and spirit. So Acts is filled with stories of people whose lives were radically transformed and who had this incredible experience. Okay, I'm, I'm not that tall. Um, <laughs> who had this incredible experience of God's transforming power um, in their hearts and their lives. <laughs> So Peter and Paul, and um, that we read about in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9, are two of these people, and their stories are kind of told in parallel throughout these passages. And faith fundamentally through them we see is about transformation and renewal. The Spirit of God doesn't just kind of polish you and make you presentable again. God's Spirit transforms us and makes us entirely new creatures and creations. 
Paul, who knew this from firsthand experience, wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 from verse um, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So by faith in Jesus and by the power of God's spirit at work in us, we are made new, not just freshened up, but transformed into completely new creations. It's a work that God does when we accept him. And when we accept Jesus, it's this once off recreation that he works in us, but it is also an ongoing work throughout our lives that we are continually renewed and restored by God's spirit. Faith has transformative power for us as individuals and for our world. And it's transformed people that make faith contagious like we spoke about last week when it is ignited by the spirit of God, as we said in week one. And so today we'd like to look at four ways in which faith transforms us which is evidenced in the stories of Peter and Paul. Firstly, faith transforms us by redeeming our past. It's one of the most beautiful and powerful things for me about the gospel is that it shows us that our current story doesn't have to be our ultimate story. You are not defined by your past, by the things you have done, by the things done to you, by your circumstances, by your history, by your experiences. The gospel message is that our value and identity and destiny lies in that we are God's chosen and beloved children, that he has redeemed us. And so you are not your past. God doesn't hold it over you. And by his grace, in fact, he actually redeems your past and uses it for his purposes. And I really felt as I was sitting up there and um, looking at the, the online people and just listening to the worship today that God wants us to know it's not just ancient history that he doesn't hold over us, that we're not just defined by our, our long ago past, but that we're not even defined by the past of last week or of two weeks ago or of a month ago, because today we are made new and we have new wisdom for today and new strength for today. And so don't keep beating yourself up about yesterday or two days ago or last week or last month or six months ago and the decisions that you made because you are made new and redeemed. And this is very, very clear, this redemption of our past in both the stories of Peter and of Paul. So if we take a quick look at Paul, we all know Paul in the scriptures. Paul cons consented to the murdering of Stephen. Do we know the magnitude of that? He consented. He was standing there. Picture this with me for a minute. He was standing there holding the cloaks of those who were doing the stoning. And he was the, the religious person standing there. He should have been the one that said, this is not right. How can we stone somebody for something they believe in? And yet he's standing there holding these cloaks, smiling, going, go ahead, stone him. And this is the, the Paul that we see in chapter 8. And yet by the end of chapter 9, just two chapters later, he, had been, he, he became the very Christ follower that he was stoning just two chapters earlier. The very person that he was trying to eradicate, he became. In verse 29 of chapter 9, it says, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and, and um, argued with the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. That is the power of a transforming faith. Within two chapters, he, he was the persecutor to the persecuted. The exact same thing. He carried Stephen's murder on, on his conscience. Yet an encounter with the Holy Spirit on the road 
as he was going to inflict more damage on the gospel in Damascus. His life was changed forever. We read in Acts 9 how Paul, then known as Saul, was breathing out murderous threats. Those are the words that they use. He was breathing out murderous threats against the Christians and was heading to Damascus to round them up and imprison them. But suddenly, something changes. And we read in verse 3 to 9, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven uh, flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do next. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. It completely redeemed his past and redirected his future towards the principles of Christ. And he could do nothing else but please Christ through building the church, through people with whom he came into contact with, whom he could share the gospel with. He was the greatest evangelist of the early church. Going from being the persecutor to becoming the persecuted. And in a strange way, the, the perspective Paul had of being the persecutor aided him in sharing the gospel with those who were persecuting him. He had a clear understanding of where they were coming from, why they were doing the things that they were doing. And he could preach to them and he could teach them like nobody else could. He wrote the book of Romans and then the letters to the churches from a perspective that nobody else could. He was completely redeemed and restored, but yet he had this clear understanding of what it was to be the persecutor. God uses, used his past experiences of someone who persecuted others to give him a better understanding of the mindset of how to approach conversations. God uses and restores our past in the present. Whatever you've done in the past that you think God can't use, God isn't pleased with, God will use to move his church forward. Paul's story is one of God using and redeeming his past in a powerful way, and then growing the church from it. Peter's story that's told alongside Paul's is, is just such a powerful one for me as well, because I think we can all identify with Peter, that he has the best intentions, but really bad follow-through. And I think a lot of our faith journeys are like that. We want to do the right thing, but we just struggle to actually do it. And Peter had a lot of flair, a lot of heart, but very little substance early on. He would make these bold declarations and one moment, and then the next moment completely flake out. The Peter we see in the Gospels is someone who kind of opens his mouth to exchange feet. He's always saying something inappropriate, and he's saying the wrong thing, and he's brash and rough around the edges. He boldly proclaims to Jesus, he says to him, I'm ready to die for you. And then he can't even acknowledge that he knows him. He chops off a Roman soldier's ear in this amazing act of courage, and then he's nowhere to be found when it really matters. And yet, what I love about Peter is he's there. He runs to the empty tomb. He leaps off a boat and swims to Jesus when he sees him, when he's resurrected. And one of the most profound passages for me in Scripture is John chapter 21, where he is restored and Jesus has this conversation with him, restoring his failures and his past. So that's the Peter that we see in the Gospels, who has all the intentions and not a lot of follow-through. But the Peter we see in Acts is a very different person. There's no fickleness or timidity about him. He's patient and discerning. 
he listens, he waits, he's filled with the spirit, and then he speaks boldly and leads wisely. And it's not all plain sailing, and his personality doesn't change. We read about um, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 and 9, and how he wants to, he offers them money to get some of the power that they have, and Peter comes down on him like a ton of bricks. His, his personality didn't change, but God uses it and channeled his, his, kind of, his zeal you know, and his passion in the right direction, and he became steadfast. He became that rock that Jesus said he could be, not by his own strength and power, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in him. Peter's story ended up being one of courageous faith, of boldly sharing the message of God. And it didn't end being a story about denial and fear. By faith, God transforms and redeems our pasts when we put ourselves in his hands. God wants to give you a new, compelling, Holy Spirit-empowered life and story as well. So these guys' lives were completely changed. They were completely transformed. And secondly, they were reignited with courage. They had a courage that went beyond their own safety, beyond their own uh, self-value of themselves. So faith redeems our past. And secondly, it also reignites our courage. It gives us new courage. Peter went from denying Jesus three times for self-preservation. How many of us have done that? To save face or to, to protect ourselves, we deny what we believe. The guy who couldn't string a sentence together. The same Peter is the one who is reignited with zeal and courage to preach one of the greatest recorded messages of the early church. Boldness and courage with no regard for his own life. No regard for his own health and safety. There are many differences in the stories between Peter and Paul. But there are similarities that, that both of them came with repentant hearts. Those ladies that were standing in front of me this morning, if you came with a repentant heart, which I believe you did, and you fully submit to the work of the Holy Spirit within you, the gospel becomes alive and active in you. Because you, you, be, you, be, you become completely restored and released from your past. And you come to the realization that it is a bigger purpose and a bigger plan than just you. You become part of the church's plan for humanity. And God heads that plan and he leads us in that plan. Each of us individually. No one knew it better than Paul, Paul and Peter. They had a clear defined plan and purpose to grow the church, to preach the gospel, to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. We know these things. And it wasn't easier. In fact, it was to their detriment. Their own lives but they didn't care. They had a bigger, bolder purpose and plan. Even with prison, flogging, shipwrecking, snake bites, and everything else in between in their imminent futures. So faith requires courage because it's hard. And I don't know if we talk about that enough. Sometimes I think we have this perception that it's easy, but it's not Faith is to be sure of what we've hoped for and the evidence of things unseen and living by things you cannot see is difficult. But the Spirit ignites that fire in our hearts that enables us to do things we could never do on our own. That same Peter who couldn't even acknowledge Jesus was preaching and speaking and defending himself before the religious leaders and the Roman rulers and whoever else needed facing off with. If you read his letters later on in the New Testament, 1 and 2 Peter, you can hear his courage and his steadfastness. And as I was thinking about this thing of courage, I wondered if maybe today some of us need a new infusion of courage from God's Spirit. Because life has been a little bit rough for the last while. 
And it's so easy for us to get discouraged. And when we say discouraged in English, we often usually think about it in terms of being sad or kind of feeling a bit helpless or feeling down. But really it means discouraged, without courage, that our courage is lost and lacking. And the early church leaders had every reason to lose their courage. There was persecution. There was misunderstanding from within, from the Jewish community. They had the Roman Empire breathing down their necks. When things were going well, they were just kind of breathing down their necks. When things weren't going so well, they were feeding them to lions. There was disorganization. There was famine. There was heresies. There were false teachers. Every kind of obstacle and difficulty we can imagine. And yet, Paul writes this, in Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, and I always feel like a wimp when I read that, knowing Paul's life. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So I want to encourage you to take courage. You don't have to rally up your own courage in your heart. It comes from knowing Jesus, from walking with him, from being loved by him, from being rescued and redeemed by him. And it comes from having the right vision. And that leads us to the next thing that transforming faith does. Transforming faith restores our vision. So a restored vision, as you can see, I'm starting all the points this morning. Okay, restores our vision. Faith actually transforms us is one thing, but faith restores our vision. For Paul, it was a literal restoration of his physical sight. After his encounter on the road, he ended up in Damascus where he was heading, blinded and waiting. I'm not sure for what, but God spoke to Ananias and told him to go and minister to Paul. Now, Ananias had a few reservations about this. The same Paul that is persecuting the church because he hadn't, he hadn't experienced Paul's transformation on the road. So Ananias was a little bit hesitant. He was like, really, you want me to go to this guy? This guy is going to, you'll probably take my head off. But yet Ananias is obedient to what the Spirit is leading him to. And he goes to Paul. And he, we read in now in Acts 9 verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, I don't know if I would have called him brother. I might have gone, you stay there. I'm going to stay here. I'll pray from you, for you from a distance. COVID regulations and all, you know. You stay there. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were, co were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. You see, for Paul, the sight, his sight was, was literal. He was literally blind. He was blinded by the light that Jesus had shone at him when he met him on the road. But yet scales fell from his eyes when Ananias ministered to him and he could see again. Yet it wasn't just the physical sight that Paul received. Paul, Paul's sight was restored, but more importantly, the vision of his life and the way he saw God was restored. And this morning, maybe you need a new vision. Maybe you need a new vision of yourself. Or maybe you need a new vision of Jesus. Maybe you need to see Jesus for the light that he really is in the world. We have limited visions of ourselves. And sometimes we place limited visions on Jesus. Jesus can't really do this. 
or the spirit within me can't really do that. Paul and Peter got to the point of realizing that the spirit within them can do all things. That Jesus has the capacity to do all things. If he conquered death, which they saw, how much more can he do in me? We don't get to restrict ourselves from being used by God. We don't have that privilege. And you are not ir irrelevant to God's eyes. He will change your vision to see what he wants you to do. He, he, if you are willing and able, if you have an, a contrite heart and a willing heart, God can use you. Change your vision of yourself and change your vision of Jesus. That scripture that Deline just mentioned now in Hebrews 11, we walk by faith. Faith is not sure of what we cannot see, uh, is being sure of what we cannot see. So we must make sure we have the right vision set forth by the Spirit. What is your vision? Maybe you need to change your vision of God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. Faith is to be sure of what you cannot see. Jesus, Jesus isn't a made-up figure, and you are not irrelevant. You both, working together through the power of the Spirit in you, can change the world. So faith transforms us by redeeming our past, by reigniting our courage, by restoring our vision, and finally, by renewing our minds. Romans 12 is one of those cornerstone scriptures that we go back to often. And here our friend Paul again writes to us. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Real, authentic faith is actually about living every part of your life as a sacrifice to God. It's offering all you are to Jesus in a response to all he has offered you. And Paul continues and he tells us, how does this become possible? He says, it becomes possible by not conforming to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Our faith transforms us by renewing our minds. When we choose God's way over the world's way, God's wisdom over the world's wisdom, God's path instead of the road that culture kind of sweeps us down, when we let God take control, when we take our thoughts captive, when we seek him, when we ask him to bring renewal, we are made new and transformed. Think of the mind shift that Paul had to go through when he went from persecuting Christians and, and, and thinking really that he was doing God a favor, he thought that was the best way to serve God is to stamp out the church, to being who he was in the end. It was a radical transformation and renewal of his mind. And the renewal of our minds is linked to this idea of sanctification. And that's maybe like an old fashioned word that we don't hear a lot, but it's a very important concept for us as Christ followers. As we said earlier, transformation in our lives happens in two distinct ways. The first one is when God comes and fills us by the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus, and we are instantly translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are made God's children. We're adopted. It's a status change fundamentally. But unfortunately, when that happens, we don't instantly become perfect. Our habits and our behaviors and our thinking patterns don't just change overnight. And that's where sanctification comes in. It's our duty as people who call ourselves Jesus followers to ensure that we're actually becoming more like him. And part of that work is done by the Holy Spirit, but part of it is done by us. It is the work that we do of drawing near to God, of learning more about him, of renewing our minds, of changing our thought patterns. And I love how Paul wrote this thousands of years ago and neuroscience tells us it's true today. You have to transform your mind with new neural pathways that you have to intentionally create by forcing yourself to think differently. And although we'll never get to a point of being perfect, we should be getting better. 
C.S. Lewis says it like this. He says, on the one hand, we must never imagine that our own unaided efforts can be relied on to carry us through even the next 24 hours as decent people. If God does not support us, not one of us is safe from some gross sin. On the other hand, no possible degree of holiness or heroism which has ever been recorded by the greatest saints is beyond what he is determined to produce in every one of us in the end. The job will never be completed in this life, but he means to get us as far as possible before death. So allow God to renew your mind, to do the necessary, often painful work of sanctification because it's painful because it forces us to be honest with ourselves. It forces us to have some self-discipline, some self-reflection, and those things don't come naturally to us. But it is the most important work we can do as people, as individuals, to learn every day to become a little bit more like Jesus. So faith is ignited by God's Spirit, and then it becomes contagious through us when we allow it to transform us. And it's this process that happens from the inside out. We are changed by being in relationship with Jesus, both the hard and painful work that we have to do in ourselves and also by this miraculous power of the Spirit at work in us. And then we become agents of God's transforming power in the world around us. We become the embodiment of his kingdom, the touch points of where heaven meets earth. Being transformed by God's spirit is miraculous, but it is also often difficult. And sometimes it hurts and we can't figure out what God is up to. C.S. Lewis says it beautifully in this image. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes to rebuild the house. And at first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks on the roof and so on. And those are jobs you, needed, you knew you needed doing, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and doesn't seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one that you had thought of, throwing out a new wing there, putting in an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. God wants to reside in you and to transform your life so that you can be a source of hope and healing and life to the world around you. So will you have the courage to let him change you from the inside out? Will you open up yourself to him and ask him to make you new and to be all that he intends for you to be? So we're going to end today as a response with that song that we sang earlier, From the Inside Out. And may it be our prayer today. I love those words. They say, a thousand times I failed, but your mercy remains. And so, Lord, as I keep stumbling and as I keep falling, renew me, transform me, take control from the inside out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your spirit comes to make us new. And Lord, that is such good news. May we be renewed and transformed in you. Thank you that you don't hold the past against us, not the ancient history of our past and not yesterday's failures, but that every day your mercies are new. Transform us, Jesus. Teach us. Give us renewed vision, reignited courage, and renewed minds that we may see things as they really are. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would transform us from the inside out so that we can be the places where heaven meets earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.